Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Father, we do look to you today, and, and we echo in prayer what we've just prayed in song, Lord, that you are great. Lord, we cannot fathom your greatness. We see aspects of it all around us. We see the sunrise, we see the birds and the flowers, we see the grass, we see the changing of the seasons, the revolving of the planets and the stars. We see in all of that your handiwork. We know that heaven declares your glory. And the firmament shows your handiwork to all people. So that there, there is no one who does not see the testimony of you. But Lord, we are grateful that you did not leave us to, to guess of who you are just from creation. But in your grace you have given us your word. You have spoken to man that we might know you, that we might know your character, your nature, we might know your holiness and your beauty, that we might know your love that gave your only son to die. We might know your grace that promised whoever believes on him will not perish but have everlasting life. And Lord, we know from your word that you are the creator you are the Savior who's calling men to yourself. Lord, we know that you have worked in each of our hearts to bring us here today. God, I thank you for that working that brought, brought us to salvation. And Lord, that continues to work in us to make your children like Christ. I thank you for that working that has been evident here in this church both for individual growth and growth in the church as a whole. We rejoice knowing that it's from you. Lord, that you have given us all good gifts. So, Lord, we, we come together to praise you. Lord, we come together as well to seek your continued work on our behalf. We are mindful again of the many needs in this church body, those that are, are physically hurting, those that are emotionally hurting. I pray that you will work in, all, in both, in all those situations. Lord, that they, you may show your goodness and your kindness, that you may show that your grace is sufficient, that in our weakness your strength is perfected, that in all of our circumstances you are working our eternal good. And Lord, that you'll remind each of us that there is nothing, nothing in this life, nothing in heaven, nothing in hell that can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus. And Lord, that we are persuaded that in all of these things we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. And so we thank you that you are enough for us. And I pray that you will make your power known. Intervene in these lives in a mighty way. And Lord, I'm mindful this morning of particularly of Diane and her daughter, Lord, that you will give an overwhelming abundance of grace to them. That you'll give Sarah great protection. That you'll give Diane great grace. And Lord, that you'll glorify your name in their lives. And again, Father, that you will glorify your name in these many other circumstances our church family faces. That you will show that you are God. That you are faithful and trustworthy. 
And Lord, that you'll show you are God here this morning, that as we look to your word, that we may see you, that we may see how we ought to live and please you. Lord, that we may be challenged, that we may be changed, that we may go out of here worshiping you in our words and our lives, that in all things we do today, we will honor you. And so we do pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm going to read just a single verse, verse 31, that we're really going to be considering much larger portion, but 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, the New Testament Christians faced a, a large number of problems that do not affect us in America today, at least not in exactly the same way. Uh, for example, the pressure to participate in pagan festivals celebrating and worshiping the gods of the city is really not an issue that we face here. No one is calling people to gather around the Paul Bunyan statue on US-2 to give him offerings of wood shavings and silver axes and ask his blessing on the community. No one is making great feasts of large blue oxen to give Paul Bunyan thanks for all the goods that he has given us in the last year. These are not things that we face, but they are situations that the first century Christians really did face. And obviously, not in, in the silly examples I use, but in a much more serious fashion. For the first century Greeks and Romans, sacrificing to the gods was seen as necessary uh, for the good of the community. So that a refusal to honor the gods risked divine wrath. A refusal to participate in the festivals for the gods showed that a person was not truly civic-minded. And a refusal to participate in those feasts to the gods could lessen somebody's standing in the community, could prob and probably uh, prevent them from receiving promotions at work or desirable jobs. It, it really hindered them in their work life and their community life. For example, have you ever worked in a place where really to get the best jobs or to get the promotions, you had to hang out with the bosses in the bar after work. You knew that those who went out and they, they drunk and partied with the, with the supervisors and the other bosses, you knew they were going to get ahead, and if you didn't, you weren't going to get much notice. And if you've been in that situation, you've experienced something similar, not exact, exact but something similar, to what a lot of New Testament Christians were facing in their communities. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul is addressing issues related to the pagan festivals. Specifically, if Christians should eat at those feasts, or if they should eat meats that had been presented as an offering to the gods. And he spends three chapters answering those questions, starting in chapter 8. And at the end of that discussion, we find one of the most important verses about that whole question. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. One of the big challenges when talking about the glory of God is making it concrete enough to be helpful. And the concrete seems to either be too narrowly defined to be of much value outside a church service, or it is too vaguely defined to be of much value in, evo in, in evaluating our lives and ministry. So some may view glorifying God as something we only do through words or songs of praise and worship. So that if I'm saying, praise the Lord, then I'm worshiping Him and everything else kind of falls into this undefined territory that maybe allows me to do more or less what I want. Uh, on the other extreme is a very nebulous idea that if I feel good about God, and I feel God, good about God while I am doing something, so if I'm having positive thoughts toward God, then I must be glorifying Him. And both of these extremes miss the biblical reality that glorifying God is immensely practical. So that our purpose 
To glorify God affects everything we do, and it provides real, measurable standards by which a person and a church can determine the actual good of their service. So we go to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, and it's speaking about individual actions, but the entire context of 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 is that of a local church, the relationship between the believers in that church, and the effect the individual's actions have uh, has upon, the, upon edification and evangelism. And so the context of this verse is not your private meals at home. It's actually not even so much our, our gatherings here together as a church. It certainly applies to your eating and drinking when no one else can see you, but the chapters 8 through 10 are dealing with public feasting. And, and when you're eating with others, what are you saying? When you're eating with others, what should concern you most is the glory of God. And in this passage, these three chapters make clear that God is not glorified when there is no concern for how your actions affect others. So chapter 10 specifically uh, discusses the impact of your eating on your fellow believers in the church the relationship of your eating with the Lord's Supper and the effect your eating has on the unsaved. And so what he is saying is that God is not glorified when you act as if only your concerns and your opinions matter. God is not glorified when you act as if your religion is entirely a private matter that no one else's opinions or concerns can affect in any way. Rather, he says, God is glorified when you make the spiritual profit of others a primary motivation in your decision. And when you view it in that light, the glory of God has direct application to the most common of decisions. And perhaps after this message is over that you will not find them so common anymore. But when viewed in this light, the glory of God becomes a group effort. And so as I've already said, the issue faced by the Corinthians was not one that we would recognize as immediately applicable to us today. The Corinthians lived in an incredibly pagan society. They were not a godless society. They were surrounded by gods. They worshipped all manner of gods as a, really as just a part of the regular routines of life. Included in this worship were these regular feasts to the gods. And depending on the nature of the feast, several things could happen, or one of several things could happen. So at some of these feasts, animals would be sacrificed there, certain portions burned on an altar to the gods. That most often happened, happened at or near a temple. And in some cases, a portion of the animal was presented to the god, maybe in a home altar. It was presented to the god, but later taken off of the altar and eaten by others. And the rest of the edible parts of that animal would also be prepared as a meal for the guests. Uh, in some cases, the feast would begin with a, a ritual offering to the God or a ritual acknowledgement of the God. I mean, kind of like, you know, we begin our, our meals with uh, a prayer of thanks to God for the food that he's given to us. Uh, those meals would begin with an offering to the gods, giving thanks to that particular deity for the good received and requesting continued benefit. And the rest of the feast was then understood to be sanctified to that particular deity. The interesting thing in that culture, the people at the feast did not need to actually believe in the gods or have any deep devotion to them. So when you think, talk about the, the Greek religions and the Roman religions, it's not as if they got up in the morning and they had their, their morning devotions. They talked to Zeus every morning. And that they got up and they read their holy scriptures and they, they read of, of Athena every day. 
It wasn't that kind of religion. It really was very ritualistic, so that all that was needed was you make the sacrifice. If you followed through with the ritual, then the gods would be appeased. If you didn't, they would be angry. And Christianity comes into that culture and teaches newly saved pagans to have nothing to do with such deities. Because 1 Corinthians here, this passage tells us that they were in fact demonic and are contrary to the worship of the true God. So that for a Christian, any participation in idol worship was to be avoided because it denied the uniqueness of God and the sufficiency of Jesus. So the pantheon of Greek and Roman gods was rejected by Christians for the worship of Jesus as the only God. And it is in that cultural setting that the Corinthians are. And they have a problem within the church now with these offerings given to idols and these feasts that have been dedicated to the gods. Because it appears that at least some of the Corinthians had recognized the false gods were not truly gods. Thus, they, they felt the freedom to take part in the Feast of the Gods. If, if Athena is just a figment of somebody's imagination, who cares if that feast is dedicated to her? I mean, would, would you have any qualms about participating in a feast dedicated to Frodo Baggins from The Lord of the Rings? You would recognize that it's just a, it's silly. It's a fictional character and it just, it maybe it's a fun kind of thing, but it's not really that big a deal. And these Corinthians were, were viewing it, I think, something similar to that. It's just, you know, it's not a big deal. They're not, we're not worshiping a God because there's nothing there. But not everyone in the church had that same confidence or freedom regarding the feast to the gods. And so Paul spends three chapters in this, in this letter addressing how they are to, to view this. And they show in the course of this just how practical and purposeful it is to live a life that glorifies God. Now, one more introductory comment. I apologize for the long introduction here, but one more introductory comment. I also recognize that this portion of 1 Corinthians raises a lot of questions. If you're familiar with 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, you realize there are several challenges to understanding exactly what Paul is addressing. I have admittedly oversimplified some of this. But, um, and so we're in some challenges to understanding what Paul is addressing, what he's specifically instructing the Corinthians to do or not do. I'm not going to answer all the questions raised by this text this morning. To walk through it properly would take at least several weeks, and I'm going to just reserve that for whenever I preach through 1 Corinthians. Uh, and instead, this morning what I want to do is I want to summarize the biblical instructions at the end of this passage. So the second half of chapter 10. And, and really there's four major things in, in this passage that shows us how to glorify God together as a church. How to glorify God in our holy life. First, do not participate in idolatry in any form. Seems like a no-brainer, but it's a bit more complex than it may initially seem. But that's the first one. Secondly, you have liberty to eat whatever you want, provided you eat in thanks and acknowledge God as the giver of every good thing. The third thing, be careful that you do not use this liberty or any other liberty in a way that would cause your fellow believer to sin or would hinder the preaching of the gospel. And then the fourth one, make the glory of God your goal in all you do. And so first, do not participate in idolatry. To, to say it another way, be holy in everything you do. Verse 14, he says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Very plain. Though we have liberty in Christ, Christians must not be involved in certain, th certain things. We do not have liberty to do anything we want and everything we want. And, and so you do not have, in, in the broadest sense, you do not have liberty to sin or participate in sin. You do not have liberty to participate in the idolatry 
of this age. And you start thinking through that. I don't have time this morning to pull out even any of the implications of that. But you start thinking about the idolatry of this age. What our culture reveres. We do not have liberty to participate in anything that has been elevated as a god. And our temples are not called temples anymore for the most part. But we certainly have them. Let me give you another example, though. You, you also do not have the liberty to participate in sin in any form. So you may have the liberty to eat a nice, big, juicy pork chop. But you do not have the liberty to go to the local marijuana shop's annual cookout and smoke off and eat the pork chops that they are serving. You have the liberty to eat pork chops. You might even have the liberty to go buy some of the leftover pork chops from that. You know, maybe Jack's is selling them later. You might have the liberty to go buy them from Jack's. You do not have the liberty to go and to, to participate in that, which is clearly sinful. You don't have the liberty to, to go hang out and frequent the marijuana shop. I mean, I think that's probably plain to all of us, but whatever the context, you say, I'm not smoking are you participating in their, I'll say, their life and lifestyle? That's part of what he is saying. Are you doing that which seems to elevate this particular sinful practice, whatever it may be, then you do not have the liberty to do it. Simply, to say it more positively, strive for holiness in all you do. Enjoy the liberties that are yours in Christ. Enjoy them in a way that is right and pure. Second, he says, give God thanks for all good things. Look in verse 30. He says, but if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? And he's, he's talked about this a couple places. This is really the last mention of the giving of thanks there. And recognizing that when we go to eat, whatever we are eating, we recognize that the earth is the Lord's. And all that fills it comes from His good hand. So that we give thanks to God for bountifully sharing His good things with us. We give thanks to God recognizing that we do not deserve them. We have no inherent right to what is God's. All the good things that we enjoy are ours solely by God's generosity. And so you go and you have that nice big juicy pork chop. You give thanks to God for inventing the pig. And you praise Him for allowing us to enjoy it. And, and I, I say that seriously, I'm, I'm, being, I'm obviously being somewhat humorous, but see that seriously in its essence, that we give thanks to God for the good things that we have. So, I mean, it's easy to say it when we walk outside in the woods and we look at the beauty. We give thanks to God for the creation. We open the refrigerator and we look at the fridge and we say, I don't have anything to eat. We give thanks to God for all the good things that fill our fridge and we have so much that we can look at and say, I don't want that, 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 I don't want that. I'm going to go get a pizza. And so we give thanks to God for the pizza. You know, it's, it, it is that mindset that says all these good things come from God so that I learn to see him in all. When you eat, when you walk along the beach, when you take a drink, drink of coffee, when you paddle down the river, when you watch the sunset, and every good thing you do, you give thanks to God. And every enjoyment of life you have, you give Thanks to God, you recognize He is truly the giver of every good gift. So that your life is a life of things. That's immensely practical. It's immensely practical as you start trying to really apply that. And you look at your closet and you think, I have so many clothes that I could wear. And I recognize that every good gift comes from God. You, you, yeah, I keep, keep going and I won't. Just, you, you give him thanks. And when you do that, when you recognize he is the giver of every good gift, when you give him thanks for all he has given, then you glorify him. The third thing, you glorify God when you do all things for the edification of other believers. Verse 23, 
Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. And so in this case, in this verse, the not all things are helpful is a synonym with not all things edify. He's saying the same thing twice, basically. So I have liberty. I have liberty whatever meat I want to eat in the context. I have liberty for, for all these good things, but not everything edifies other believers. So the one question we must ask about any activity is this. Does it promote Christ-likeness and Christian maturity? In other words, does it edify? And we glorify God when the edification of others takes precedence over our own liberty. And this loving edification of others is one of the larger principles that is being taught in these three chapters. And so go to chapter 8, verse 1. I'll just point it out to you here very briefly. He starts off talking about, again, the meat offered to idols. He says, now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. So he starts off recognizing that believers had come to an understanding of the falsity of idols. They knew idols are truly nothing. And therefore, they appeared to have concluded that, I mean, what is offered to an idol is offered to nothing. Nothing can't pollute anything, so it must be okay. That seems to be part of the logic there. However, their knowledge was separated from love. And what Paul does, he starts off on this whole section, and he warns that knowledge promotes pride. Now, Paul certainly is not opposed to believers increasing in knowledge. He prays in Philippians for the believers to grow in knowledge. He wrote extensively to churches, including the one that he's, he's telling them, warning them about knowledge. He wrote extensively to these churches, teaching them greater knowledge of the things of God. We see from scriptures that increase in knowledge is essential to Christian growth. But knowledge alone promotes arrogance in the student. So when we learn something, we are tempted to look down on those who do not have the same knowledge we do. We tend to feel a subtle sense of superiority because of what we have learned. We may, especially when it comes to these matters of, of Christian liberties, we're inclined to smile indulgently at those who haven't learned what we've learned. And we're a little bit patronizing toward them. And what he's saying is that love, knowledge separated from love, is not edifying. Loveless knowledge is, in fact, often used to the detriment of other believers. And I don't mean that it's intentionally used to hurt others. Sometimes it is, but not, most of the time I would say it's not. Usually it's an unintentional and it's hurt, but it still does injury to other believers. And so those who know but do not love show their lack of love. So they may say, yes, I love my fellow believers, but they show in their actions that they lack love by their concern, for, their lack of concern for how their actions affect other believers. They show they don't love because they don't really care how their, their actions are affecting anyone else. So then Corinth, those who were convinced an idol is nothing, were neglecting the fact that others did not have the same certainty. And in so doing, they were participating in meals which caused their brethren to stumble into sin. And this absolutely happens in the church day, not necessarily with meals offered to God, but in a wide variety of ways. A Christian becomes convinced of the rightness of an action, and he does what he knows he can do, regardless of how it affects other believers. For example, a Christian discovers a worship band that they love, and they begin to pressure the church into bringing a similar band or style into the church with absolutely no thought for how an action would, that action would affect the consciences of other Christians. 
And then if, if the concerns of others are brought up, the one with knowledge begins accusing the church or Christians of being too rigid, being too legalistic. The one with knowledge has freedom. And because they lack love, they are insisting their freedom be catered to instead of restraining their liberty for the sake of another's conscience. Another example, a Christian learns about Calvinism. And he begins to tell everyone about it. He insists it is the only proper way to understand salvation. He begins to argue with other believers to convince them their less Calvinistic understanding is wrong. And he does this with no regard for the understanding of others who may be hearing the conversation. He does it with no regard for the the convictions that another one has reached after their own careful study of the Word of God. And so he begins to offend and alienate another believer because a knowledge he possesses that another does not. And these kinds of careless, thoughtless responses indicate a lack of love. Loveless knowledge does not build up others, but puffs up the individual. And so to edify others and glorify God, knowledge needs to be joined with love. So when your knowledge is tempered with genuine love for your fellow believers, you will apply that knowledge with wisdom. You might be right, but you do not have to always convince the other person that you're right. You don't have to argue about every point of theology and every issue that comes up. You do not have to do what you have the freedom to do. Instead, you give people time to grow. Your zeal is tempered by genuine concern for what truly builds up your fellow believers. So you know you have the liberty to do something, but you consider how your actions may hinder another believer, may keep them from growing in Christ. And uh, love refuses to tell the other person to stop being so sensitive or to stop being such an old fuddy-duddy or however we may say it. Love does not complain about the unfairness of personal liberty being restrained by another's conscience. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul uses his own life as the example of this kind of self-restraint and self-denial for the good of others. That's what he's talking about. Our decisions are made in light of how they affect other believers. So that knowledge that edifies is knowledge wisely applied with love for one another. Knowledge that edifies will take care not to lead another believer into sin. Look back in chapter 10, verse 32. Chapter 10, verse 32. He says very simply, give no offense. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. That word offense is not speaking about hurt feelings. He's talking about those things which would cause another to genuinely stumble in their walk with the Lord. So have you ever walked through a very familiar room in the middle of the night, maybe all the lights are off, and you discover that somebody has relocated the footstool? Maybe you stub your toe over it, maybe you trip and fall over, but you've had a very painful interruption of your journey. Somebody has put a trip hazard there, and it's got you. That's the kind of thing that this offend is talking about, those stumbling blocks, those trip hazards, that which would truly cause someone to stumble in the course of their Christian journey, would cause them to to halt their progress, or worse, may even set them back in their Christ-likeness. So you may feel like Charles Spurgeon and think that you have the liberty to smoke a cigar in the evening. He actually did that. Um, you may believe you have that liberty. However, if you have a fellow believer who struggles with addiction to cigarettes and you're smoking an evening cigar will tempt them to start smoking or to continue smoking, then what this passage says is don't smoke. Don't do it, regardless what the culture says about smoking. That's not the question. The question is, what impact will it have on your fellow believers? Don't do it 
if it's going to in some way encourage them to sin. So you may have the liberty to eat anything. But if your eating is going to tempt someone else to eat that which they believe is forbidden, then you had better not eat it. And Paul actually goes far and says, if meat causes my brother to offend, I will eat no meat. And it seems to me that what he is saying is if this particular meat might cause my brother to stumble, then to be careful, I'm going to become a vegetarian. That seems to be what he's talking about. But that we restrain those liberties that may be ours if it's going to cause another believer to sin it's going to, or present any obstacle to their growth in Christian maturity, then we need to set it aside for the sake of that other believer. Then we also, we do all things for the salvation of the, of the unsaved. Verse 32 again says, Give no offense to Jew, Gentile, or the church of God. There's three groups of people that are there. The last group, the church of God, is the saved. The first two groups are the unsaved. The unsaved Israelites and the unsaved Gentiles. And he says in verse 33, Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. What Paul says is, I'm not seeking that which would benefit me. I'm seeking that which will bring them eternal benefit, will, will, will help them come to salvation. So in the context, the unsaved Jews held very strong convictions against eating certain meats. And the Bible just says simply that if eating a particular kind of meat would hinder a Jewish believer from coming to salvation, then the Christian who desires to glorify God would refuse that meat for the sake of the Israelites' conversion. So if we lived in a largely Jewish community and we're trying to reach them with the gospel, then it might be very well necessary and wise to say we are not going to eat pork and bacon and ham. That they, we not present any hindrance to them coming to faith. There were many pagan Gentiles that considered their gods to be real. They viewed the feast and offerings as genuinely necessary worship of divine beings. And it seems to be that if they saw a Christian sharing in that which had been devoted to idols, that at least some of them would begin to think there were no real differences between Christianity and the Greek religions. They would be inclined to think that Jesus is just another God to be added in with all the rest instead of He is the only God of heaven, the creator of all, and the savior of sinners. And if a Christian's eating meat offered to idols would hinder an unsaved person from coming to Christ, then the God-glorifying response is to refrain from eating. And so if there's any area of Christian liberty which if exercised would hinder a believer, an unbeliever from coming to Christ, then to glorify God, we must set that liberty aside. That's what he's saying. We restrain our liberties for the sake of the gospel. This does not mean that we compromise on biblical truth, that we hide the parts of the gospel the unsaved find defensive, or that we participate in sinful behavior to win the lost. It's, the passage is not teaching us to do whatever we have to for the unsaved to like us, The passage is teaching that we restrain our liberty if by doing so, another would be helped come to saving faith in Jesus. And the Christian who desires to glorify God will refrain from anything that hinders the spread of the gospel to the lost. Last, we do all to the glory of God. I mean, really, to sum up this passage, it's teaching that we do not eat or drink for ourselves. I mean, even if you want to say that most selfish of things that we do, we do not eat or drink for ourselves. We do all for God's glory. And we do that with an eye on how our actions, something as simple as food and drink, affect the faith 
of others. This passage teaches that the glorification of God is not a private exercise in which our own feelings are most important. The glorification of God is a public matter in which the effect of our actions on other either displays or hides the glory of God. And Paul says that whether you're eating or drinking or whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. No area of life is excluded from this command. We must do absolutely everything to the glory of God. The Bible knows nothing of a divide between the sacred and the secular. For the Christian, every decision of life is sacred. Everything we do is to be an act of worship that displays the magnificence of our God. And this is certainly true when we come to church, when we interact with other Christians, or we attempt to give the gospel. It's also true when we go to work, we go to the store, we gather with neighbors, we watch television, we go on vacation, you visit the kids or the grandkids, you play games with your friends, and every other thing that you do in your life, every aspect of it is to be lived for God's glory. You were created, saved, and gathered together into a church to glorify God. Proverbs 16, verse 4 says, the Lord has made all for himself. Revelation verse, chapter 4, verse 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Romans 11, verse 36 says, Of Him and through Him and to Him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Our task is to give unto the Lord the glory that is due to his name in everything that we do. Let's in there. Uh, Lord, we come to you and we do ask that we will glorify you. And Lord, we will seek to understand more fully how to apply these principles to our life. That God, we may, may exalt your name in everything. That we'll be careful compassionate and looking around us to see how our choices, how our lives are affecting the edification of believers and the evangelization of the lost. That, Lord, we may truly glorify you as Christians and as a church together. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll continue at work in us, that all of our lives will be pleasing to you. We ask this in your holy name. Amen.